doesn't love music? Rock, rap, classical, jazz. I mean, music's helped get me through college and some pretty dramatic life experiences. Today, Vincent with Keep Music Alive is here to speak about how music, listening or playing unintentionally, intentionally can make a difference in your life at any age. It is with the greatest joy to welcome Vincent to the Success You Show today. Welcome, Vincent. Oh, thank you so much, Susan. Thanks for having me on. I'm excited. Yeah, Vincent, let's just jump right in. Like, what's the origin story behind, you know, Keep Music Alive? Well, it goes way back several years. Uh, I mean, I'm a lifetime musician, songwriter. Uh, I have another career uh, that puts food on the table for many of those years. Uh, that's kind of a story in itself. I always wanted to be a musician full time from the beginning. I wanted to go to college for music. And my parents, like many parents do, steered me toward what they thought was a more practical path. And I ended up going to school for engineering. Uh, and then music has been a lifetime passion and love for me on you know nights and weekends, anytime I can do something. And you know I've done everything from being the songwriter being a band manager, uh, owning, co-owning a recording studio, booking shows. And then I became the artist myself, putting out my own CDs, promoting to radio. Uh, so many different things. Uh, for many years, I wrote custom love songs for weddings and anniversaries. I have another website that's kind of dormant at the moment because I haven't <laughs> had time to do anything with it. Uh, lovesongs.com, where I would write you know, songs for uh, couples and families for weddings and anniversaries. Uh, but I always felt like there was something missing in my music world, all these different things that I tried. Uh, and then one day I heard there was going to be a, a teleseminar back in 2014 about how everyone has a book inside them that they need to write. Uh, I'll be honest with you, Susan. I never thought in my wildest dreams I would ever write a book about anything. I'm like, I don't consider myself an expert at anything because, you know, my engineering career, I never really focused on it really well because I had this music stuff going on. And the music I could never focus entirely because I have this engineering stuff going on. So there's just no real thing I'm like, I put my finger on you. Yeah, I'm an expert at this and people might want to buy a book that I write. But I'm like, something drew me to that teleseminar. So I listened to it and halfway through, it was like a bolt of lightning hit me. Well, wait, what about a book of inspirational stories of how music changed people's lives? And I'll tell you, I got all excited. I ran up to my wife, Joanne, upstairs and tell her about it. And she got excited. And that's where the whole, we started to take the turn towards music education advocacy was yeah. actually with the book series, which became 88 Ways Music Can Change Your Life. Mm -hmm. And it kind of started snowballing from there. Uh, that was in May of 2014. And we started, you know, reaching out for stories around, the, you, know, not, you know, both the US and around the world. We, in the end, we reached out to over 6,000 musicians asking them if they had a story they would like to contribute. Uh, because we were just sheer numbers, just trying to get, you know, as many good stories as we could. Yeah. Because, you know, we were nobody, nobody knew us. Who are you? What are you doing? And why, do you, <laughs> why should I send you a story? Uh, but, you know, many did, including a number of celebrities, which is really heartening because again, you know, we didn't have any track record and we still had people in that first book that, you know, submitted a story or submitted a quote and said, yes, you know, we'll put our name and something behind this for you. And we were just so very grateful. Mm -hmm. So we're in the process of reaching out for stories. And then uh, I think it was March 2015, you know, we had, we were, book hadn't yet been published. And then I had this crazy idea, you know, there should be a week every year where musicians everywhere offer a free lesson to new students uh, just to kind of get them started. You know, sometimes you just need to like put that guitar in someone's hand, show them a couple chords and kind of whet their appetite, you know, whether it's a child or an adult and get them started. So that first year in March 2015, I just all I did was just put out a couple of social posts. You know, it's nothing official, nothing formal. But, you know, again, the things, the little ideas are turning. <laughs> uh, and then the next year we made it a little more official that, you know, we started contacting music schools mm. and saying, hey, would you like to participate in what was becoming Teach Music Week? Wow. And, and I think that second year we had 23 locations in eight states that said yes. They would participate you know we threw together a website we started contacting media and this is where you know the keep music alive nonprofit starts to germinate starts to form uh it's just a very loose organization at that point mm -hmm. and then we met a gal 
who was doing something called Kids Yoga Day. Hmm. And I was like, exactly. I went, hmm, Kids <laughs> Yoga Day. That's really cool. I wonder if there's a Kids Music Day. Yes. So, you know, on the computer type, I can't find any such thing. Well, there is now. <laughs> we just made it up. So that October in 2016, we launched the first annual Kids Music Day. And we partnered, you know, with the same music schools and music stores to instead of offering a free lesson, they hold some sort of special event or promotion that benefits or celebrates kids playing music. It could be everything from a uh, kids open mic, an instrument donation drive, an instrument petting zoo. It could be a student performance either in-house at their location or somewhere out in the community. It could be even a kids music day sale on instruments or accessories. Anything they can think of under the sun and some of them get very creative. Mm-hmm. Some sort of event and <laughs> celebrates kids playing music. We're, we're game for it. And we're now partnering with over a thousand music schools and stores around the world in like 15, 16 different countries to participate in these holidays. And when we were starting all this, Keep Music Alive was still just an informal organization. But <laughs> I was starting to get the idea that my, my reticence to going through the hurdles of creating a nonprofit is probably hindering more than it's helping me. <laughs> so we said you know what we have to actually you know formalize this and so we applied for and received our 501c3 that was actually october of 2017 but we'd already been going for a couple of years mm-hmm. and then it just keeps growing every year uh, my wife joanne is a huge part of this because she's the one that's home full-time able to do most of the reach outs and we do individual reach outs to like music schools and stores uh, mm-hmm. over about 5,000 each year two different passes to them, you know, encouraging them to participate. And we've only recently started to bring on some uh, volunteer help to help, you know, relieve the carpal tunnel <laughs> going on. Yeah, you. Oh, uh, so, so Vincent, like, I don't mean to interrupt your origin story and how this all happened, but like, you know, I have to ask a question, like how did 2020 impact your mission? And like what you guys are trying to do. I mean, 2020 like impacted a lot of people. How did it affect you guys? Well, it was definitely a huge curve, you know, for the whole music world. Uh, You know, we were just coming upon Teach Music Week in March. You know, the middle of March is the third week in March. And that's exactly when things went (laughs) downhill. Uh, You know, we had a number of music schools and stores that, you know, they were going to participate. And then it just kind of mostly fell apart because, they were scrambling just to be able to get their existing students, you know, online for, you know, lessons to keep their business model going. And to their credit, they did an amazing job. I mean, literally on a dime, so many of them pivoted and were able, were doing online lessons with the majority of their students, you know, within a week or two, which we were so happy, you know, to see that. So as far as Teach Music Week in 2020, that was kind of a wash uh, and by the time we got to Kids Music Day in October, though, uh, many of the music schools had, you know, they kind of had their thing of how they were doing things, the precautions they were putting in place, mm-hmm. and they were able to, you know, many of them were start being able to do events. A lot of them did virtual events, you know, to be safer, but some yeah. of them were able to do socially distanced events. Mm-hmm. We had drive-in concerts where, you know, mm-hmm. the music school would have a stage at a parking lot next door, and the kids would perform separated with masks, mm-hmm. and parents <laughs> would pull up, you know, in their car and, and you know, listen to the parking lot. So ideas like that, which are really pretty cool. The one thing that was really affected by us, you know, other than the fundraising aspect of our operation, which, you know, everybody took a hit last year, uh, was we also do musical instrument petting zoos year round. And yeah, yeah, people, when you give me that look, people are like, what is that? Yeah, they just see the look, I was like, what? (laughs) What is that? And it's true. Because when we first heard that term, maybe three years ago, we were like, what is that? I got to find out what that is. And basically, we, you know, uh, are there animals? You know, I still have people that ask me now. You know, are there? There's not going to be any animals here, right? You know, the library wants to know we're not bringing animals. Yeah. <laughs> we bring guitars, ukuleles, uh, keyboards, dozens of different types of percussion instruments, uh, and so it's kind of like a please, please touch museum for instruments where you know the kids come in with their families, or if it's in a school environment, you know, they're coming in with their teachers. And they literally get to put their hands on all these different instruments. We have volunteers that come with us, you know, they help put the guitar in the child's hand, show them how to hold it, how to hold the pick. 
make a sound and make here's how you play a chord here's how you play a single note you know we have electric guitars acoustic guitars the ukuleles keyboards all it is so much fun uh you know we've even done them you know in addition to schools and libraries we've done a couple of what i call marquee events you know where uh, we've gone out to the rock and roll hall of fame in cleveland and done an event there for kids music day the year before the pandemic we've done a couple at our local legoland discovery discovery mm -hmm. legoland in our philadelphia area and it's just we love my wife and i both just love the joy of seeing seeing the joy on the child's face you know they they start to play they mess around they look at mom dad grandma and grandpa like can can i want to do this and yeah. then we and then you know we've done our job you know is we've inspired them to think about playing a musical instrument and the reason that we do all of this is we're trying to help more kids and adults reap the many benefits of playing music whether it's the educational benefits for kids or the therapeutic benefit for kids and adults and the social benefits for, for all ages you know yeah. so the pandemic was rough certainly uh but you know we we motored on we we're able to do some things we did some online musical instrument padding zoos mm -hmm. and they're really you know showing <laughs> musical instruments show and tells you know yeah. here's this instrument here's what you can do on it uh but you know the child can't reach through the screen. Yeah, <laughs> that's a little more challenging. <laughs> a little more challenging. You know, we haven't quite got that technology down yet, but you know, I, I think it's coming. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So, so Vincent, like I know schools are lacking. My kids go to a private school, and it's a small private school. And you know, unfortunately, the art, music, is one of them that's always affected. It's like the first thing that people like you know, cut out of their budget. Right. Yeah, we, they always cut the arts first, whether it be drama, the music, whether it be band, it doesn't matter. And so like, does your, does your organization, your nonprofit, does it help, I guess, educate and keep those programs alive? Like, do you have that ability to be able to help schools to um, show like, you know, hey, this is why it's so important. I mean, I know that the directors are doing a great job. Like our band director is doing a great, great job. But do you guys also provide that or help with that? We haven't specifically done that yet. Now we are members of what's known as the National Association of Music Merchants. Mm -hmm. And they have a huge advocacy arm. You know, they go to Washington every year, they meet with many of the elected officials and they lobby you know, for, you know, music and arts education budgets and to make sure that they're getting put in there. And then the other piece of it is a lot of times the school districts have to jump through hoops. Mm -hmm. Somebody at the school district has to jump through hoops to, 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 to be able to access certain funds that have been made available that if they don't jump through the hoops, you know, they're not going to get the funding to do this, you know, what some people consider extra things. Uh, so other than through our social sharing we're not doing any direct support of that just time limited we don't have there are a number of organizations doing that already uh, and we try to share that information uh, but we definitely over you know as time goes on as we grow and we actually start having a full-time staff uh, <laughs> right now we're all volunteers uh, you know that is definitely an area that we want to be able to assist in uh, you know both you know locally here and on a national scale uh, right. just to, to help you know the school district you know the uh what do you call it? the superintendents and the other elected officials of the school board underneath them understand because you're right a lot of times you know historically music and arts have not been what has been considered a school subject uh, a core subject you know there's stem you know science technology engineering math which is great i get it uh, i'm an engineer it's very important <laughs> right but... however, however you know they've been rightly you know we've been turning the boat to from stem to steam adding the a in the middle for arts yeah. and it has been getting quite a lot of play and looking at and you know that's what's really helped you know nam and other organizations uh the other one is another one is the national association for music educators nafme you know they lobby you know constantly and you know that's going from stem to steam and putting that focus on that and showing the decision makers why and how music and arts education is having such an important effect when you have it. I mean, the kids stay in school longer, the graduation rates are higher, the testing rates are higher, uh, the happiness rates are higher, which, you know, they don't necessarily care about that, but the first two they really care about. Exactly. Uh, you know, if 
you know, the quote that I always like to use is, you know, so many of the most successful, you know, scientists, inventors, doctors, entrepreneurs throughout history credit music and arts education for part of their success, you know, enabled them to think outside the box. It's funny, I learned something, you know, you know, researching some of the research and we don't do any research ourselves. So we research <laughs> the research. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and, you know, when kids have music and arts education, you know, in their developmental years, there's this little pipe between the left logical side and the right creative side mm -hmm. called the, uh, you know, I'm losing the name, corpus callosum. Yeah. <laughs> that pipe where the information goes back and forth between those two mm -hmm. sides gets bigger for the ch children that have music and arts education. Really? It increases more, you know, they did a, you know, test case, you know, where you have this group of kids that don't have it, this group of kids that do have it, measure the before and after, you see the growth here and that enlarging that pipe, you know, the extra neurons going back and forth. That's why we have kids and later as adults that can more think outside the box, more creative solutions. Hence you have the success in so many other fields that are important. I mean, I like to tell people we are not trying to make every child a professional musician. Right. That, is, that, is, that is not the goal. I mean, that would be really cool, but that's not the goal. The goal is to give every child the best chance of success, no matter what career path they later choose in life. And music and arts education is the way to do that, hands yeah. down. And do you find, Vincent, that there are demographics that are completely being missed by music? like like social economic demographics um cultural demographics you know certain areas of the country that are just completely being missed by music that would greatly benefit from this i don't have the statistics on any of that but i think in general i can say that a lot of times it's the inner city schools and also the more rural schools you know that are missing most of the funding you know where they don't have either it's a tax base that isn't there or the economic base of other things going on in the area that isn't there. Uh, you know, so the funding isn't there for the schools to be able to, you know, whereas in the suburbs, I mean, I live in a nice suburb here outside of Philadelphia, and most of the schools in our area have pretty good music programs as a result. But you go 10 miles and go into the city, and it's not the case everywhere. You know, you know there are fortunately a lot of other nonprofits that have programs that offer free music programs to school to students in that area you know we work with some of them to help them donate instruments and stuff like that uh they're one of the beneficiaries to our book a particular organization uh so fortunately there are organizations that exist that try to fill the gap there but you know it should be coming from the schools first you know so why so Vincent, why is it so important um to get celebrities or those that you know are big names part of this like Obviously, you know, I read, you know, Jack Black has been part of this before. Mm -hmm. um, why is it so important to get them behind it? Well, it gives us a bigger voice. It gives us, you know, it makes more people pay attention. I mean, when Jack Black, uh, well, just to take a step back, you know, last year when we talk about, you know, the COVID year for Keep Music Alive, uh, one benefit that we had that wasn't directly related to COVID, but it just kind of happened was last year was the very first year that we actually had a spokesperson for Kids Music Day. We've had a number for about three years. We've had Kids Music Day ambassadors, which is great. They lend their name and their image for us to use to put out there. You know, it makes the public take more notice. It makes media take more notice. I get more media, return my emails yeah. and want to do something <laughs> about it. Of course, you know, the larger media, they don't want to talk to us. They want to talk to, to Jack and Julie Andrews and whatnot, which is, you know, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't care. I don't, I don't need them to talk to me. I just want the big media to talk about Kids right. Music Day and why music education is important. Yeah. I don't need to be on TV. That's just not, that's not what this is about. But when you have celebrities that lend their name and image, and that's been a great help. But last year, we also, in addition, Matthew Morrison came to us and he's been on Glee. He was a star on Glee and on Broadway. And he said, I would like to actually be your spokesperson for Kids Music Day this year. And that was, you know, last year, the fifth annual, which is a big year. And with that, you know, we were able to get exposure for Kids Music Day on Entertainment Tonight, People TV, uh, Good Day New York, and a number of other programs around the country, because he was willing to do interviews 
you know, to help, you know, because then, you know, the media really like, what, you have a celebrity that wants to, you know, will talk to us. <laughs> yes. But but because he did that, you know, he also put together a very special presentation that premiered on the Grammy uh, YouTube channel, Grammy Museum YouTube channel, where he performed several songs and dancing, he had dancers and all that from his Disney album. Uh, and we were able to also have Jack Black and Vanessa Williams did a video uh, you know tribute to right. kids music day and let me tell you they were just the awesome, most best awesome thing you know having matthew and jack and vanessa together as part of this presentation that we were able to use to spread out you know to the media and to the public you know that despite covid going on we were able to get you know significant number of eyeballs on the importance of music education you know through the vehicle kids music day yeah did you ever in your wildest dreams when you <laughs> you know, and Joanne thought about this, did you ever think it was going to get this big? And like, obviously it's still not at its pinnacle. It's not at the biggest point yet, but did you ever right. think it'd be here, like in, in working with these celebrities and working with and making such an impact across the country and the world? Well, it's kind of funny that you asked that, Susan, because, because in the beginning, you know, when we thought up Teach Music Week and in Kids Music Day, you know, we weren't even thinking that far ahead. <laughs> It's only been more in the recent years, in the last couple of years, you know, where we started to see some of the success that we've been having, that we start to do what I'll call, I don't know if it's long range planning, long range, <laughs> envision, you know, creating a vision. Where is it we really want this to go? You know, and, you know, in my mind, the legacy we want to leave is for Kids Music Day and Teach Music Week to be there for generations to come to help support getting more kids and, and adults access to music education to be able to play a musical instrument so that they'll receive the benefits. So, you know, when, someday when we leave this earth, uh, that those holidays will continue on and there'll be an organization here that will help keep it going. And then just having more families be able to take part in the opportunities. But, you know, in the beginning, no, I it's never even like, if you would, you know, if somebody had asked that question, you know, I might have sat back and thought about it. Uh, you know, that would be really cool. Yeah, yeah maybe, you know, have some celebrities. But in the beginning, no, no, no idea. No, and I think, I think what brings us back to, you know, you know, 88 Ways, you know, you know, why you guys wrote it. And then, like, you know, you said you had no idea, like, write a book, eh, no, thank you. Could I really do it? Who cares? I mean, right. like, the fact that you did it, I mean, was that, I mean, obviously, I've published many, many books. And, so for, for you, for someone who's like, that was never on their radar, <laughs> no, I you know, it was like, yeah, this is it. Well, how was the experience for you? Uh, it was a journey for sure. And it's, it's funny, you know, I have released a number of, you know, records, uh, well, there were CDs over the years. Uh, I think I might've done a record in the beginning, uh, <laughs> but the, the kind of way, you know, I'm, I'm always project minded. So the mm -hmm. kind of way I started out is I pick an end date. Okay. I want to do this thing. When do I want to release it? So I pick a date, sometimes mm -hmm. it's realistic, sometimes it's not, <laughs> you know how that is, right? To Absolutely. pick a date, I'm, I'm, I'm often optimistic, I'm always optimistic, yeah. I pick a date, and it's funny, the original date we picked was actually May 1st, 2015, to publish the book, it would have been basically a year, a little less than a year from the idea okay. for having the book, and, you know, we just started reaching out, and reaching out, and reaching out. And then I think we got to January 2015 and I'm looking at the stories that we had coming in. I'm like, we don't have near enough. <laughs> We're not even going to get close to this date. So then we went into overdrive and just, you know, reaching out and reaching out and then, and including celebrities and trying to get permission uh, and all that. And, uh, you know, the people were great, you know, the managers, the agents, the publicists, you know, many of them were just so gracious and, you know, responding to us and, you know, connecting us with a celebrity for the story or the quote. Uh, but we were able to actually, you know, well, there was one point that I realized, all right, May 1st, that's not happening. <laughs> no. <laughs> but, I'm, but I'm not moving it much. So June 1st, and we met June 1st. So we published the book, the original book, 88 Plus Ways, Music Can Change Your Life on June 1st. And there was a second edition that we did in November of 2016, yeah. which might be what you're looking at. Yeah, I, I was looking because I was like, wait a minute, mine's a second edition, so. Yes, there's a whole, there's a whole nother story behind that. You know, you learn so much the first, mm -hmm. as you know, I'm sure yeah. the first time you put out a book, you know, we made 
you know, many mistakes. We tried to make, tried not to make the same mistakes when we did 88 more ways, which just came out this past January 1st. Yeah. That's, and that's what I have, right? Uh, that okay. is the, that is the original one. Okay. 88 plus ways music can change your life. And that's probably the second edition. Does it have the little yellow second edition on the, on the spine? Um, it does. Yeah, so that's the second edition of the original book. Okay, perfect. But you know, we all learn, you know, my wife and I, we learned so many lessons yeah. and we're still learning. Yeah. As you know, but it was a crazy journey. And, and, and probably the craziest part was like the last week, you know, when you know you're, you're sticking to this date. Wow. So you get all these stories in and, you know, I have to tell you, us musicians, some of us aren't the best writers. <laughs> so there's a lot of editing that goes on. Uh, and then there's a lot of back and forth. Well, sometimes we would get a story and I'd be like, eh, eh. but then I see something in there like, you know, I think there's more to this story. Yeah. And so I reach back out and we go back and forth a couple of times and I start to pull out. Oh, OK, OK, this 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 moves me. This 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 is something that should definitely be in the book. Yeah. Uh, whereas, you know, sometimes we're so close to our own experience. You know, we don't always realize what that little nugget is that others would really want to hear. Uh, yeah. So there was a lot of that, a lot of back and forth with some of the uh, contributors and editing. Uh, and then at the end, you know, we self-published through Amazon, through the, it was originally CreateSpace and now it's through the KDP interface, uh, which is awesome that that ability exists. And, but then the whole, you know, I'd never formatted a book before, you know, <laughs> the, both the paperback and the, and the ebook, you know, the first time you upload it, like, yeah, I think this is going to be good. And then you get, you know, just the electronic proof back and looking. Yeah. This is a problem. <laughs> yeah. You know what? I just, I just uploaded uh, four books. Oh, and, wow. You are brave. Okay. Yeah. The process is very long now. Cause back then, cause when I did my first one uh, back in 2005, but now it's 2013, I think I really re-released it anyways. It was so much quicker. Now it's like a seven to 10 day turnaround. And, you know, I thought I had everything and then uh, and everything was wrong <laughs> like oh so it just delays everything so I completely understand that it's like work with me here <laughs> <laughs> yeah I mean however you know whatever mechanism whatever platform you're using to publish your book uh you know you get to that part near the end where there's going to be you know unless someone's doing it for you and they're offered you a turnkey situation you know for a price obviously sure. then you you the author and are the, also the publisher and you are the one that's going jumping through all the hoops, learning the steps, you know, figuring it out, you know, and, you know, doing, you know, asking Dr. Google about this or, you know, doing social posts here, or there, somebody else has seen this problem, help yeah. me out. And, uh, you know, the, the internet community is, 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 is great because you get so many answers mm -hmm. that help you that, you know, 10, 20 years ago, we would just bang our heads for months. Yeah, like, exactly. I, I always tell people like, you don't understand. We didn't have this back in the day. Everything was pen and paper or it was a typewriter. You're like pecking at the key. <laughs> and yes. then you have the little whiteout blots. You know, you have to like go back. And I was like, oh, you guys just don't get it. You don't understand it. But so how did you, like, I'm, I'm interested in Vincent. How did you get Jack Canfield? Like, how did you get Jack? He's big and he's written... I mean, hundreds of books. I mean, he is phenomenal. And I was extremely impressed by them. Well, there's a little story to that. So the coaching program that we're, we're in originally, mm -hmm. uh, Jack comes to speak once a year as part of that program. So, you know, we had heard Jack speak. And actually, the funny thing is, I'm going to go back 2009. The person that puts that, Steve Harrison in the Quantum mm -hmm. Leap program that he puts on, uh, I had met before many years and I met actually ran into Steve at a horse farm one day in 2009 because his daughter and our daughter were taking horse lessons horse riding okay. lessons and uh, you know they weren't taking lessons to be a horse it was horse riding right. lessons <laughs> and and he said hey you know I have you know Jack Canfield coming to my event next week why don't you see if you can come so he invited me to come just as a guest mm. and that was kind of when the first seed was planted you know, Jack has one of his, my favorite books of his, you know, aside from the Chicken Soup for the Soul series, yeah. uh, is his Success Principles book. And, you know, I was able to get out of work that day. I think my boss was like, you want to go take off to do what? <laughs> I'm like, in my mind, I'm like, I'm going no matter what you say. Yeah. <laughs> Just to say, no, I'm going. Uh, 
Uh, but when my boss was good, she says, you know, great, no problem, you know, enjoy. And so I went and, and that's kind of when I got the seed planted about, you know, writing. I didn't realize it, but the seed was getting planted about writing books, even though I didn't know it in 2009. And then we later joined that coaching program and got to hear Jack speak again, both my wife and I. And we had the opportunity to go to Jack's house later as a mastermind. Mm -hmm. It's basically a separate thing. And as part of that, you know, Jack got to see the book. It actually, the first book was out, the original first edition. This is where we were learning about all our mistakes <laughs> <laughs> from the man who knows best. You know, he's holding in his hand. He's giving us a lot of great feedback, a lot of great advice, the things we did good, things that, you know, we should consider changing and why. And as part of that, you know, he, we didn't realize that Jack himself actually is a musician. He plays guitar. His children all play music. Uh, we had no idea. So he kind of, you know, had a connection with him about that. And, you know, he was basically giving us, you know, a quote, you know, that we could use uh, to help share, you know, about what we're doing. And, but we didn't talk initially about, could we use it for the forward, you know, in such a uh, formal manner a forward right. for the book. Uh, but later we saw Jack again at another event, different event. And uh, thanks to my wife's prodding, we got up to, go, you know, the, the the guts to uh to ask Jack, hey you know this remember this nice little paragraph thing that you gave us before you know could do you mind if we could actually use that you know as a forward for our book and he's like no problem no problem at all we were like oh my god this is great <laughs> no you know vincent and i think i think that's a great point that you bring up is that i think things come into our lives when they're supposed to come in and i think sometimes we put these celebrities up on a pedestal and we sometimes, if we just ask, they're okay with it and, and they're willing to help other people because they know they've come from places and they know, yes. you, I mean, it's not like you guys are like, you know, can you endorse this? Because we expect to make thousands of dollars to put in our pockets and you're doing a great thing for other people, you know? And so I think sometimes if we just ask. Yes, yes. And you, and you, and you bring up a great point also is the whole asking thing. I mean, Jack talks about, you know, you need to be an askaholic. <laughs> you know, you know, you need it's it's a numbers game. You gotta ask a lot of people to find the people that will help you. I think there was about 140 some publishers they got rejections from for chicken soup for the soul until yeah. the 144 said yes. Mm -hmm. And it was only said said yes. And if you can show us that you'll get at least 10,000 or 20,000 orders of the book uh through all their speaking engagements. But the thing is to keep asking, and one of the quotes that I like to talk about is that silence never means never means no meaning you know we ask somebody for something you know whether it's in person or we send an email particularly if we send an email or a message or a facebook message or text or whatever and sometimes you don't hear anything back right. and then our mind starts or, you know, creating all these reasons exactly. oh, they hate us they think this is a terrible idea right. oh my gosh no 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 silence never means no it doesn't mean anything you know right. it's stuck in their spam folder they're yes. on vacation they saw it and they're interested but they got sidetracked yeah. uh they saw it they have to think <laughs> about it uh they never got the email at all it just completely did not show up yeah. in their email system at all yeah. every one of those reasons and, and more is why you didn't hear back so until the person writes you back and says don't you ever contact me again <laughs> Exactly. Which, is, which, you know, which almost never happens. Feel free to wait a week or two and ask again. Yes. Feel and I think, I, I, think that, I think that's so important because, you know, even for this show, I know you guys, you know, you guys uh, sent me a message and I saw it on my phone and I was out and about because I coach volleyball as well. And, you know, our season's nice. pretty much over. We have to go to nationals in Vegas yet, but like <laughs> I saw it and then you know, because it, it takes it off of like the scene. So you can't see that it's highlighted anymore. And even though I started, like, I just got onto something else. And then I responded. I was like, oh, bummer. Like, you know, I try to respond within 24 hours, but I, I saw it on my phone <laughs> and then yeah. I didn't respond because when I go to look at my emails, it looks like I responded, but I really didn't. So, um, so many people, you know, we are all in interrupt driven mode in our lives, you know, in our professional and our personal lives. And, you know, media people, you know, like yourself and others are so many, are so busy and you get so many requests. I mean, the national people literally get hundreds of emails 
a day, you know, like I'm trying to contact the Ellen show or this show or that show, different producers. And I know they're getting deluged every single day, you know, and I'm trying to just put that one special subject line that, yeah. you know, with an idea that might get their attention, you know, and, I, and this has worked for me in the past, you know, 20 years ago, I, did, I one of the song releases I did was a novelty song called uh, Y2K making fun of the whole Y2K thing going Yeah, on. like the, and, the whole, the whole uh, earth was going to crash, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> so I reached out to some shows back then and I actually sang that song on the Jenny Jones show. Oh. Which was a national TV show back, you know, and right before the turn of the mm -hmm. millennium, uh, which was really cool. But I know just, you know, it's persistence. I call it polite persistence. Just reach out, you know, yeah. ask again, ask a different way come up with a different media idea three months from now, ask them something else. I'll tell you a little story. Uh, we reached out to a particular celebrity many times mm -hmm. and we were initially looking for a quote for one of the 88 Ways music books. Mm -hmm. And this person's people, their publicist, their manager, their agent, you know, we reached out to multiple people, never, nothing back, never, radio silence. Now, most people, after a while, you would just give up. I'm just going to stop contacting. This person is just too big. They are, they're not going to respond to anything. But, you know, we had a different idea. Hey, you know, we're doing this Kids Music Day ambassador thing that, that we made up. And, uh, you know, let's, let's ask them. So we wrote them again. About a week later, we got an email back. First time it says, Julie Andrews would love to be a Kids Music Day ambassador. <laughs> That's awesome because you know, Vincent, you just don't know the reason why. Why they said no. Because you know, they maybe they go through a whole bunch of different publicists, maybe they go through whatever, and and they've heard, you know, uh Miss Andrew say, you know, only take these specific ones or only do this. Yes. Or whatever. You you just never know what happens. And so good for you guys for being so tenacious and like just being like, you know what? We're going to keep going. We're just going to keep doing this. <laughs> you know, if you're trying to be successful in anything in life, you know, yes. you learn that you just have to keep moving forward. Yes. You're going to have naysayers. You're going to have pit pot hole, potholes along the way. Things are going to go wrong. But if you keep moving forward, okay. keep reaching out, keep making new connections, keep, you know, yes. following up with old connections until people tell you to go away. <laughs> You don't need to go away. <laughs> exactly. And I think I think that's so important because, you know, when I started season three, I was like, okay, I'm going to take a different approach to this. I'm going to go after some really big asks. Good. And um, they all worked. It was weird. It all worked because I think it was during like, it was during the pandemic. And so they were like, you know, everybody has nothing to do. Everybody's just at home. They want more to talk and stuff. And and since then, it just kind of snowballed and snowballed and all these pair people were reaching out. And this guy, um, he has a big podcast. Uh, you know, he's, he's big and, and he put like my, my podcast show and my YouTube video, whatever was like the top 2021 to be on and be part of. And I'm like, Love okay, that. I'll take it. And, and I got this really big lady on, <laughs> like, I didn't really know who she was. And I started reviewing her. I'm like, oh dear heavens like <laughs> yeah i love uh, when that happens when okay, you realize yeah. how big somebody is who's who wants to be in, you know work with what you're doing yeah and it was amazing and i mean her her interviews that she does are all these people that i've known and i've taken courses from or i've read their books or whatever so it was pretty phenomenal and she was so amazing and genuine and just an absolute blessing to be around and she was just so cool and so you know I think I just brought a different spirit to her because she's so used to like, I think more formal, more like ask these questions and that's it. And I was like, eh, I don't roll that way. <laughs> no, no, you need to be yourself. You know, you need to, you know, in my emails that I send out, you know, it's funny, you know, my wife likes to be more formal and I'm like, you know, I'm just like, this is me, you know, it'll, okay. The grammar might not always be perfect. But it's pretty good. And yeah. you know, I'm just trying to have a little bit of fun. You know, like we reach out for sponsors every year. We're trying to get financial sponsors for Kids Music Day and Teach Music Week. Uh, and, you know, it's a hard road because getting mm -hmm. getting these folks to, you know, write anything back, you know, or pick up the phone or return a you know, phone voicemail is near to impossible because, again, they're getting bugged by so many people. And, yeah. you know, but it's persistence. And it's also knowing that, you know, you're doing your show, you're in your third year. So you start to have a track record. Yeah. And as you start going and you keep, and if you keep reaching out to the same people, 
over time, you know, mm -hmm. not every day, not every week, but, you know, periodically, and you show them that you're making progress, that on your own, you're building something, mm -hmm. you're building something. And at some point, one by one, those people are going to be, you know what, I should pay attention to this because this person isn't going away. They're getting bigger. You know, their cause is getting bigger, what they're trying to put out into the world. And I really respect that. I mean, people that are already really successful respect when others, you know, like us start from nothing and yeah. we build something up on our own and we're tenacious with it. And, and over time, many of them are going to respond. Yes. And you don't change who you are. I think that's important. You know what yes, I mean? Absolutely. Because, because like you said, like if, if, if you're, let's just say, for example, if Joanne is always sitting this way or puts out this and then say they meet you but you're a completely different person it just throws off that vibe but if right. you guys can both be authentic in who you are and what you're striving for i think that's a huge huge connector with with the audience with the potential donors with the potential sponsors with the potential people that are advocating for you guys i think that's huge is you know not only being tenacious just being who you are i mean oh. If you oh, see absolutely. me on the street, this is what you're going to get. <laughs> yes, yes. And we, you know, and each of us have, you know, each person, each of us has our own personalities and yeah. our own style. I mean, Joanne definitely has our own very friendly, very outgoing, yes. you know, like I was saying, telling you before the interview, you know, if you get her talking, she's just, the energy is just there. Mm -hmm. uh, it's taken me a long time to get to this point <laughs> where she had it when we met. <laughs> Well, you're an engineer by trade, Vincent. So yes. position where you just like being and just playing and you just get into that vibe. So, you know, I, I think that's great. I mean, what is the best way for someone to get involved with you guys? Like, obviously, you know, I don't live in Philadelphia. Many people listening to this are going to be from all over. What's the best way that they can get involved? Uh, probably the best way to contact us would be through the Keep Music Alive website, which is just keepmusicalive.org. Mm -hmm. You can learn more about Kids Music Day, Teach Music Week, about the Instrument Petting Zoos, uh, and contact us through there if you'd like to help in any way or just learn more. Uh, for the book series, you know, we're at 88waysmusic.com. And I didn't mention that we do donate 80% of all proceeds of the music book series 88 ways music series to four different music education nonprofits. there's hungry for music mm -hmm. there's musicians on call there's rock to the future and then the other 20 percent goes to keep music alive to help what we're doing yeah. and it's just again we're just trying to keep putting it back out there into the universe to help more people you know what i think that is amazing and i didn't know that when i bought it I just to let everybody know, I didn't get this gifted to me. I literally bought it as well. So I had no clue that it was, you know, that 80% of it was going to be donated. So I think that's a great thing to do. And of course, in the show notes and on the blog and everything, I'll definitely put all that information in there. So people really, really know that it's important, you know, to go out and get the book and to get the books. And I know that I read on here and on the site that you can actually buy in bulk. Is that, yes. is that true? Correct. Yeah, so, so through us, if you contact us directly, you know, whether it's through Keep Music Alive or 88 Ways Music, you know, we'll obviously respond. <laughs> yeah. uh, and we know we offer, if you buy directly through us, and you know, if you're buying 10 books, 20 books, whatever it is, you can get a discount. You know, we sell them, I think even just for like 10 books, uh, it's about between seven and $8 a book. To, and that includes shipping to anywhere in the country. Wow. Yeah, that's a huge deal because I think... Um what my book was probably 12.99 yeah it was about 12.99 yes yeah. i think it was about 12.99 on amazon plus, plus shipping if you don't have prime yeah well i gotta <laughs> i have prime because i've got a lot of books <laughs> <laughs> i buy a ton of books and so that's the that's the other thing like you know um we are going to talk more in depth because we're going to go through these stories on our next uh part two on our next interview series so i'm looking forward to that but you know you know what are what right now is the greatest needs with music in schools? What's the greatest need that you see right now? I think finding a way to give access to more kids, you know, whether it's, you know, allowing an outdoor program to come in, you know, not just after school, you know, during the school day, you know, as part of, you know, something that's structured, you know, yeah. or finding a budget. And you have, sometimes there's communities where they do their own fundraiser to hire the band teacher, mm -hmm. to hire the music teacher, because they're like, you know, we want this to happen in our school and it's not in the school district's budget. So they go out of their way to find a way, you know, right. to raise the funds. But I think that's 
that's the thing. I mean, they're obviously outside of school, there's so many other ways, you know, the music, music schools, both the chains, you know, where there's music and arts, School of Rock, so many, and all the different independent, you know, thousands and thousands of, you know, wonderful independent music schools around. Uh, but I think it's also important to have it in the school, to start it in the school, to plant that seed. Because, you know, when I was in fourth grade, you know, I had, I'll tell you a quick little funny story. Oh, you're you know, good. It's when the, you know, the, you know, we first had the opportunity to learn a musical instrument. I remember yes. coming home that, that first day <laughs> from school and telling my parents, I want to learn how to play the guitar. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the funny thing is, I know the guitar was not even one of the instruments that was offered at school yeah. but at that time. But my parents said, no, 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 pick something else. I'm like, okay. So I went back to school and I found out, you know, I could learn to play drums. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I was part of school. So I came home and said, I want to learn to play drums. And my parents said, no, even louder. <laughs> like, we don't want that racket in this house. <laughs> so they said, go, go try again. So I ended up picking trombone and I played trombone all through the senior year of high school, you know, concert band, marching yes. band, jazz band. Yes. And, and band was my family. That was my social circle. If, if it was not for band, I don't know that I would have had any friends at all. It's just that I was so much of an introvert, mm -hmm. you know, but band, you know, forced me to be around all these kids and fellow students on a more regular basis to participate in activities together. And that was my world. And that was kind of the first, you know, my own first personal eye-opening experience of how important music was to me, aside from what it was doing up here and making me a better future engineer between my, <laughs> exactly. my brain. Uh, but just the social aspect was so important. I know our daughter was in marching band and she didn't actually even play an instrument. She, she plays piano you know, for fun, but she uh, did the flags yes. in band, four years of high school. And again, that was her social circle. That was her friends. Yes. You know, that was her lifeline, you know, despite all the challenges of marching band and how difficult it was because they did competitions that were very yep. competitive and, you know, but the, the whole social aspect, aspect of it, you know, is just critical for kids to have that because many kids don't fit into any other you know, they're yeah. not sportsy. They're not real smart. You know, they don't fit into any other natural yeah. thing where they're going to draw together with other kids. So music is one way. If the school district, if schools have some sort of music program, you know, those kids are going to find each other, be drawn to each other through that program. They're going to make friendships. And just the, I don't know, the benefits are through the roof. You know, just have to find ways to get more schools to be able to fund it. Yeah. And I completely agree with that. I was a clarinet player. And I played, you know, all through high school, mainly because my mom's like, look, once you pick, a, once you pick an instrument, you got to keep with it. Cause it was very, very expensive back then. Like we didn't have like all these lending programs. You had to buy the instrument and it was so right. expensive. And, uh, I hated the clarinet because I didn't like the reed, the, the wood. <laughs> oh, it was like the word. It was like fingers on a chalkboard for me. Oh um, my. And I really wanted to play something else. I was like, I'll do the drums. I'll do anything but this, but I couldn't switch. So it is what it is. But now my, my kids, my daughter played the drums and she was excellent at it. My son played the drums, was excellent. She took up, um, she has a keyboard in her room, you know, all this stuff. Our biggest thing was we had to choose because we're in a small school. We're only offered so much. It was so right. sad because we couldn't fit everything in and that, you know, my son had to stop, you know, he didn't like singing but he loved a band but he couldn't be in it because he had to take these core classes my daughter had to pick between music and band because she ran out of time you know in right. the day. and it was so sad because she loved band and she loved music so she had to choose and I think that's so sad in schools when you have to now choose because yeah. oh. you know and she didn't want to have to choose but you know she ended up choosing singing because it fit better in her schedule to get her classes in so she could graduate. I mean, you know, so right, it, right. I think there are oh, schools that are going through that as well. Yeah, that's such a shame she wouldn't have been able to continue with band, you know, without having, I guess they had to have the band class to stay in band, but that's, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, that's I mean, it, yeah, it, it is, it's hard. So what are three ways, you know, um, as we're closing this session out, what are the three ways that, you know, people can get involved with music and then 88 ways, keep music alive? Like how can people get involved? Three ways. Three ways to get involved with what we're doing or three ways yeah. to get involved with music in general. Three ways to get involved with what you guys are doing. Well, many of your listeners may have their own music story that they'd like to share, whether it's something they experienced personally or something that they witnessed, you know, was there a situation involving music that made them kind of like get goosebumps or tear up or just go, oh my God, I can't believe that happened. Yeah. We are always accepting new stories for the 88 Ways Music Can Change Your Life book series. 
We're accepting them through the uh, website, 88waysmusic.com. Uh, for the nonprofit, Keep Music Alive, you know, we're looking for volunteers always. I mean, if you're in our area, great, Philadelphia area, there's hands-on <laughs> opportunities. But even if you're virtual, you know, we're lo always looking for new board members. We're looking for people to help us promote uh, the music holidays, people to help us with fundraising. I mean, we are new, total newbies on fundraising. You know, we're learning, you know, I like to think we're crawling. I'm not even sure we're crawling yet, but we're, you know, any type of help, you know, volunteer help in that aspect. And, you know, reach out to us if you have an idea in your own community where you can think would help with music, bounce some ideas off of us, and maybe we can help, help you get started, you know, in your own area, helping things out. I think I think that's a great thing. And when you're talking about fundraising, I'm um, I'll have to get in touch with you guys because I'm kind of a genius at fundraising. Um, oh my goodness, <laughs> I love you. <laughs> I don't know why. I, I, I guess it's just because I just know who to call or or how to say it. I don't know, but I, I seem to do pretty well at it um, when I've done it for some other organizations. And so, um, absolutely, I love those three ways, and I love you know, your guys' mission and, and everything that you guys are doing. Because I think music is so, so important, whether you listen to it, play it, are involved with it, whatever it is, I think it's so important. You know, when I worked in the hospital uh, years ago um, as a therapist, you know, music was one of those things that we did. And I think it, it was, oh, wow. you know, especially like, you know, one of my units was like the Alzheimer's unit. And I love working with Alzheimer's units. It really calmed them down or those with traumatic brain in injury, you know, that was a huge thing for them as well. And then obviously when, when we worked on the kids unit, you know, connecting them with it. And um, back, back then it was, uh, what it was at the blue man group. Yeah. The blue man group, you mm -hmm. know, the drums and all that, that was huge. For people. And so working with kids and just getting them to bang things and do different things like that was huge for them. I mean, it was, it was music, whether it was, you know, professional music or not, it was still, it was it's an all it's all music and when you you know combine the tactile sense of you know holding the drumsticks or, or hitting something hitting a drum yes. with hearing the sound or hitting the keyboard or guitar strings to hearing the sound you're combining those senses together uh the touch and the hearing you know and it's it's doing stuff up here and it's making kids smile yes you know, it on is. The, they on on the inside and the outside and wait till we tell, talk about some of the stories in our next segment we're going to do. I mean, you know, you talk about, I didn't realize you worked in a hospital. There's so many stories, you know, uh, to share about experiences in hospital type settings uh, where music has just been so amazing in situations where an Alzheimer or dementia patient will literally come out, you know, from head down and up and start singing along melody and words with a musician that's performing. And as soon as the song is done, they're they're back down into this catatonic state and not responding to pretty much anything else. Mm -hmm. The music, it's got this little magic key. Yeah. It just turns it on. And and the children with autism, you know, you yeah. get them introduced to playing music, they start to become more social, interactive, even with family members, with friends. Yeah. Uh, it's it's I don't know, it's just it's just amazing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And like I said, I used to live, listen to classical music when I was in college um, because it really helped me focus and study. Um, and I know there's a whole bunch of research done on it and how it really does work, like when you're really trying to study and concentrate. So I, I used to always listen to classical music in college. Um, obviously, I listened to a whole wide range, but yeah, I think it's so beneficial, Vincent. And I can't wait till our next session when we can dive in and just really start looking and, and having you read some of these amazing stories in here. Um, I'll pick out a couple of my favorite as well. Hopefully they're your favorites too, but, um, you know, I'll have some in here that I think, I think are, are just special and that other people should hear. And so I'm looking forward to that, um, next segment and we're going to actually do that next week. So yes, um, yep. about that. Susan, thank you. Thank <laughs> you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Sex, awesome. Success to you. Thank you for everything that you're doing. And uh, this has been one of my most fun conversations I've had, you know, on air. <laughs> thank you. Well, thanks, Vincent. You know what? I just like, you know, it's, it's just, it's so funny because back in the day, you know, having a conversation with someone like in your home or your home office, it just was not heard of. Everything had to be so professional. And so like, you know, cars driving by that was unacceptable. Dogs in the backyard and barking, you know, kids knocking. That was just not unheard of. But now it's like our new norm. Yes. You know, we're, we're all at home now. We're all, you know, sometimes we have a studio we can go to now, but for the most part, we're all still at home. And so it's just, 
it's just become the new norm. Yeah, that's be ourselves. Yeah, I love it. That's what it is. So can you, to close this out, can you give me one of your favorite quotes? Hmm. If it was easy, everyone would be doing it. Oh, I love that. It's true. It's Success true. is never easy. Pick your passion and run with it. It's not going to be easy, but if it's your passion, you'll enjoy it every step of the way. I agree. And with that, I cannot wait for part two uh, where we're going to talk about 88 ways music can change your life and really dive into these inspirational stories within here. So I look forward to that. Vincent, thank you so, so very much. Um, I wish you nothing but happiness and success. Oh, you're welcome. And thank you so very much, Susan. You have a wonderful evening. You too.